All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Attentive SMS Plus Restaurants webinar. I'm Amir Zamanian, GM of the Food, Beverage, and Restaurant Vertical Business here at Attentive, and I'll be moderating and participating in today's session. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Attentive, we're reinventing business consumer communication with our best-in-class SMS First platform. We're empowering brands to compliantly grow their SMS audience while leveraging behavioral data to send hyper-personalized messages throughout the life cycle. Globally, we work with over 5,000 brands, including major retailers like CB2 and Urban Outfitters, and restaurant brands, including Jack and Box and TGI Fridays. Across the board, these clients are using SMS and conversational commerce to expand the brand reach, increase frequency and loyalty, seeing upwards of 20% of the digital sales attributed to the channel. Now, before we introduce our partners and panelists today, I want to take you guys through a few housekeeping items. Um, today's panel is being recorded. You'll get the email tomorrow. So don't worry about writing everything down. Uh, we want this to be interactive, so be sure to use the Q&A tab on the right and submit questions to our panelists. And to get the most out of today's event, stay tuned afterwards to join our interactive roundtables led by each company, where we'll actually dig into the, deeper into today's topics, provide tips and strategies. Now let's get started with our incredible panel. Both Bounteous, Hathaway, and Radar are fantastic partners of Retentive, so we've invited them to share their expertise and insights on multi-channel strategies, including SMS, specifically for restaurants. I'm thrilled to be joined by Ellen Green, VP of Growth Marketing at Bounteous Hathaway, and Nick Patrick, CEO and co-founder of Radar. Ellen, can you tell us a little about yourself and Bounteous Hathaway? Absolutely. Thanks, Amir. And thanks so much for having me. So um, I'm Ellen Green. I'm the Vice President of Growth Marketing here at Bounteous Plus Hathaway. Um, I lead the loyalty and CRM practices, and we call that growth marketing because it's all about driving incremental growth for our clients. Um, Halfway was acquired by Bounteous last fall, um, but has been historic in the industry for delivering industry-leading digital experiences for some of the nation's top restaurant brands. And so our value proposition is really bringing together the holistic experience. So everything across mobile apps, websites, and CRM and loyalty to be able to maximize value for our clients, but also create these seamless experiences for our customers. Thanks, Alan. We're thrilled to have you here. Nick, the floor is yours. You can tell us a little about yourself and Radar. Yeah, thanks, Amir. Great to be here. Uh, so my name is Nick Patrick. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Radar. We are the leading geofencing platform, and we power location-based experiences like arrival detection uh, and, and order firing for curbside pickup, on-prem experiences, store locators for a number of great restaurant brands, including Panera, Pete's Coffee, CKE Restaurants, uh, we launched back in 2016, uh, 2016, founding team met at Foursquare. So we've been in and around the location space for a while. Uh, since then, our tech has been installed on over 100 million devices. Uh, and we work with uh, not just QSR brands, but also uh, leading uh, retail brands, real estate apps, travel apps, gaming apps, so on and so forth. Uh, you can find us on the web at radar.com. That's great. I know there's there's a lot of similarities these days between retail and restaurants, some of the other verticals. I'm sure some of the folks on the call, not in the restaurant industry, will also get some benefits from this conversation as well. All right. Well, let's kick things off. And without further ado, I want to start with our first question. Um, so in today's world with changes to email and privacy, there's no better topic to start on than data, specifically first party data. Uh, Nick, I want to start with you. How does first party data and customer profiling help drive campaign personalization? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, at Radar, and it's probably no surprise, we see first party data as the, the future, especially when it comes to location data, um, which is particularly valuable, but also particularly sensitive from a, from a privacy perspective. Um, you know, when we started the company back in 2016, the location space was filled with ad tech companies, or, uh, you know, some of them call themselves location intelligence companies. Um, and there was a lot of third-party data flying around. This was kind of back in the day when, you know, flashlight apps might collect your data 24-7 and, and sell it to a hedge fund. Um, and a lot has changed since then. I think, um, you know, privacy has become much more important. Um, and, and really, uh, you know, we set out pretty early on to build uh, the, the privacy-first location platform. So, I, you know, I think when it comes to, to first-party data, you know, major advantages, uh, it's, it's cleaner, you know, it's sourced directly from end users. So you sort of can trust the accuracy and uh, the quality of it. Um, you know, it's more privacy friendly, you know, no question about where the data came from, uh, whether end users provided consent, you know, so on and so forth. Um, lots of different types of first party data that, that can be used for personalization. So, you know, preferences, demographics, behavioral data, purchase history. Uh, I, I think Amir and Alan might talk about some of that. Um, 
but you know, of course, uh, location data as well, which is what we think a lot about at, at Radar. Um, obviously, this data can enable um, all sorts of different types of personalization. Um, you know, we think a lot about right place, right time messaging at Radar. So, um, you know, think about campaigns or messaging for in-store offers, um, you know, offers when you're nearby the store, location-based messages during a pickup or delivery. And, um, you know, ultimately done well, I think that means better user experiences, increased app engagement, increased spend, um, so on and so forth. You, you know, I think biggest challenges that we think about uh, with first party data is, is getting users to opt in and, you know, getting to, to scale with that data. I think the solution there is, you know, get users to, to download your app, you know, create value for them, um, be very clear about what data you're collecting and how you're gonna use it to, to build trust. Um, and ultimately, that's how you earn opt-in and, and empower these great uh, personalized experiences. That's great. Thanks, Nick. I know something you and I talked about was kind of the concept of cleaner data, which I really like, especially when it comes to first party. Um, Alan, I know you live and breathe first party data. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I feel like we have the benefit of having some pretty rich first party data, considering that we do run loyalty programs and strategy for a lot of our clients. I know one of the things that we heavily lean into is the use of purchase data and using that to drive personalization and kind of getting into even things like micro segments based on different types of foods that people have tried. Um, one of the things that I'm a huge fan of and always advocate um, from a client perspective implementing is a data capture strategy. And so one of the things that we work with clients early on in engagements to do is kind of map out that ideal customer experience and what that should look like, and essentially all the data that you're going to need to power that experience. Now, granted, that data strategy is going to evolve over time, but even when you know a new member is joining your loyalty program, there's going to be elements that you're not going to be able to get just from their transactional data, at least not right away. Um, but a lot of our clients are looking for different ways to actually um, enhance their segmentation or use essentially some data capture elements to be able to do that. And so we're looking every since the very start of the customer journey and what that looks like throughout the onboarding process and start looking for ways to be able to enhance the data that our clients capture. Uh, so for instance, you know, we have one client um, that in their onboarding series, you know, they want to know who people are, who people are buying for and are actually able to deliver a personalized offer based on what they choose in that communication. And then that also gets tagged on their profile for future segmentation. And so we found it extremely effective, you know, to the point where, you know, they're increasing a lot of their new member purchase rates by about 3x by being able to personalize that experience up front. And I think there's lots of ways to activate this. Um, we can activate it in the email channel and the SMS channel, as well as throughout the digital experience. And so, you know, making sure that you have the right technology to be able to power this is really important. Um, and I think the last piece that we have a lot of conversations with clients about is about like um, preference and preference centers specifically. Um, and I think there's a lot of debate on whether or not to have preference centers and how important that is. And I think the, the biggest key there is making sure that if you are going to have one that you're able to activate on it. Um, and so I know some people like to ask about like frequency, but then they want to send all the time. And so making sure that you're able to actually abide by those preferences um, and really listening to customers and activate that on key. Uh, so if you are going to have one, you know, keep it simple and make sure that you are able to activate upon it. Yeah, I really love that. I think a lot of times we, we kind of use the analogy of like collecting first party data is kind of like dating, right? You don't want to ask for everything up front, but I really like kind of the concept of this this progressive profiling. I think progressive profiling done right can do a lot of things for your brand. I think this also kind of falls into a lot of what we're seeing. I think at Attentive on the SMS side, you know, we're ultimately seeing that the value of collecting phone numbers is just increasing as a first party data point. I think most consumers, as we know, have only one phone number, one device, and they rarely share it or change that phone number versus, you know, three email addresses on average. And we also see a pretty wide adoption of SMS. So that for these reasons, we've just seen the value of this first party data point be really huge. I think the other thing we're seeing is that a lot of our customers are using where all the traffic is going to capture first party opt-in. So a lot of our clients are using some sort of opt-in mechanism on their website and they're collecting on average, I think 5% of their web traffic each month into a first party opt-in. Um, I think the other things we see is that a lot of folks make the mistake of using preference collection as a one-time thing, right? I think preferences are great, but it needs to be routinely updated. So a lot of our clients are actually using 
two-way messaging, which is pretty unique inside of SMS to get these user-driven preferences. So this is something as simple as what's your favorite flavor, um, what's your preferred channel, some sort of gamification or brand marketing opportunities. But I think having a two-way conversation on text messaging helps you gather some of these data points to help personalize the journey. Um, I think the other thing we're also seeing is the value of combining data points, right? So, you know, one source of data should never be enough. I think for restaurants specifically, the best combination we're seeing is loyalty data, uh, uh, location data, and e-commerce data all kind of mixed together to help you personalize these campaigns a little bit more and more. So I think we could probably spend a whole session on first party data, but we've got to move up. So let's wrap up this first session with, or this first question with a pro tip. All right, when it comes to leveraging first party data, um, as we talked about, I think it's really important to enhance your marketing campaigns in terms of leveraging different types of data points that actually personalize the messages. So being able to collect uh, browsing behavior, purchase behavior, location, and combining all this together ultimately helps you create a much more personalized experience. So the, the moral of this story is try to connect that first party opt-in to some sort of behavioral data or transactional data and things like that. All right, now let's get into our second question. Um, now we know for most businesses, especially restaurants, purchase frequency and lifetime value are really critical for long-term success. Uh, I know both Radar and Banyas Hathaway are doing a lot of work in this topic. So Ellen, why don't you kick us off and kind of talk to us about uh, what you guys are doing in terms of increasing purchase frequency and lifetime value. Yeah, absolutely. So we've actually done some research on high value restaurant customer segments and kind of defined um, you know, six different segments, but two of them are extremely motivated um, in two different ways. And one of them is very value motivated. So things like discounts are very meaningful to them where there's actually another segment that's really high value that has a lot of share within the restaurant industry that really cares more about um, recognition community and a lot of the social aspects. And so we find that if you're able to identify a these different customer segments within your database, um, it actually drives a lot of incrementality and so that you can actually focus your strategy and not give away discounts where you don't need to. The other thing that we uh, believe is that loyalty is, is an outcome. And so it really is this whole notion of building a deeper relationship with the customer and the brand. And there's both transactional and emotional elements to that. And so a lot of what we're doing from a measurement standpoint is looking at not only driving, you know, incremental transactions through frequency is one of those main areas, but, but also looking at it from an emotional standpoint, um, where a lot of the customer lifetime value elements play into that. And so, you know, we're using loyalty to be able to understand customers um, segment in a lot of the ways that I mentioned above uh, to really drive those incremental behaviors. So things like, you know, new menu, new menu trial and purchase frequency and things like that. Um, but we found that going beyond a lot of those transactional elements to be able to create emotional connections. You know, there's some industry research out there that that's, it says three times higher. Uh, life, customer lifetime value when you're able to create that emotional connection. And so, you know, driving these emotional experiences and tying it back to the business objectives um, is where we're seeing a lot of brands that succeed. And so we work with a lot of brands in the industry, you know, one of them uh, launched a product that customers were really asking for. And it's interesting because we've been working with this brand for a long time. Um, and this product launch was unlike all of the others. It was something that customers asked for. They listened to them. Um, they basically brought it to life based on their feedback. And it's, it's this whole element of um, you know, asking and being able to act upon that to build the emotional connections. And I think it's pairing that with things like just the seamless experience of making it simple and easy to do business um, at all touch points and even celebrating moments throughout their journey. You know, so celebrating when they're trying a new flavor or celebrating their tenure um, and really recognizing that within the brand. Um, you know, some of our clients are doing it in fun ways, such as, you know, reaching out to customers whenever they do their first weekend visit, and then all of a sudden they're a weekend warrior, or giving them a high five whenever they reach their, first, their fifth visit. And I think creating a lot of these magical moments is what's going to create the lasting effects that translate into frequency, but also customer lifetime value. That's great. I mean, I, I completely agree. I think a few things that stood out to me, Ellen, is, is one, there's different motivators, right? Not everybody cares about a discount or a price. Um, 
And kind of that emotional connection, I think, is really important. I think that goes back to, again, two-way messaging on SMS specifically can help you create that. Because, again, email, you typically don't respond. Push, you don't respond. But text, you're used to responding and saying something back. So I think that helps create that, that, that personal connection. I think the other thing we're seeing is that, again, leveraging all this data helps you create smaller and more personalized segments, right? I think it's the age old thing of, you know, batch and blast is kind of not going to work for you long term. So I think what we're working on on the SMS front is really helping gather insights and feedback from the customer and then using this to create connections. And I love what you said about kind of rewarding specific milestones, right? Whether, you know, it's workout devices like the one I have behind me or, or something else, they're always telling you, hey, you finished your, your 10th workout or this is your, your first time coming in. I think all these things kind of get you somewhat invested into the brand. And I think that's the difference between a loyalty program versus just increasing frequency, right? I think the other thing we're seeing is that campaign frequency is really important as well, right? I think you got to have the right mix of transactional and triggered messages, but also, also creating some sort of ongoing sequence of campaign messages promoting, to your point, new products, new channels and initiatives like an app uh, promotion, new locations opening up, celebrity endorsement. There's a lot of ways to leverage kind of seasonal holidays and brand holidays to bring people back into your brand experience. Um, of course, the last thing we always suggest is doing a lot of testing, which I'm sure you guys work on as well, right? You know, the discount rationale, that the copy, image, no image, things like that. Um, Nick, I know what you guys do on Radar definitely impacts customer frequency, especially when it comes to that last mile. Um, do you want to touch on this a little bit for us? Sure. Um, you know, at Radar, we think a lot about the, the Amazon effect or the Uber effect. And, you know, Ellen mentioned these magical experiences. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of take it for granted, but, you know, we can order a package on Amazon. It shows up on our doorstep the next day. We can see exactly where it is uh, in transit. You know, we, uh, we hail an Uber. We can type any address or place name on the map. It, it drops a pin. We can see the driver coming to us. We can see the ETA. Um, you know, so consumers have kind of come to expect these magical, seamless experiences. Um, and that's true whether, uh, you know, they're, they're hailing an Uber or, or ordering something from Amazon, but also if they're placing a delivery order with a restaurant or pulling up for the drive through or for a curbside pickup or, or whatever. Um, turns out this stuff is really hard to build. And, and actually, pre-radar, uh, I was on the product team at an on-demand services startup here in New York. We wanted to build this really seamless, slick, Uber-style you know, see the ETA of your service provider, um, incorporate maps and location and, and, and all of these things. It's just really hard to do. And it's really hard to do well, especially when um, you, know, you have a small digital team or engineering team um, or, or, or maybe don't have one um, at all. So, you know, at Radar, we, we want to provide the infrastructure for our customers to build these types of, uh, you know, Amazon or Uber caliber um, location-based operational experiences. And, um, you know, I think how that ladders up to, to customer lifetime value is better experiences set you apart. You know, customers come back more often. They place more orders. Um, you know, uh, their spend is higher. And ultimately, that ladders up to, to higher uh, lifetime value. So that's how we see all of that fitting together. Yeah, I think this reminds me of that, that, you know, the anecdotal stat we all hear that it only takes, you know, one poor experience to drive a customer away forever. Right. And I've seen, especially with the restaurant vertical, a lot of these last mile, last kind of delivery points being really crucial in terms of communication as well. Um, before we move on to the next topic, let's get to our second pro tip for today. Uh, and the pro tip is all about turning consumers into super fans. So again, we talked about frequency doesn't always require loyalty, but more of being able to promote things that actually bring person down into that brand experience. So using whatever channel you're using, but in this example, SMS to promote location specific offers, maybe there's only certain things available in certain stores. Uh, limited time deals or promotions, app only promotions that help drive downloads, or even invitations to join uh, your loyalty program, other things. But ultimately, I think the goal here is to leverage channels to actually drive consumers into different parts of your brand and different ways to reactivate them time and time again. All right, moving on to our third question. And Nick, I want to start with you. Um, when it comes to this omni channel strategy and execution, we talk about a lot. What are some of the do's and don'ts that you see? Sure. Um, you know, I would say, do you think about location? Um, I, I think folks tend to think a lot about uh, different ordering channels, different devices, but I think it's also important to think about how customers are going to be engaging with uh, you and, and your brand and your apps uh, at different physical locations um, at uh, different parts of the, the customer journey. So I think in order to deliver 
um, you know, the most seamless omni-channel experiences. You want you want all of these experiences to be location aware. Um, and I think most apps that you download, whether it's a QSR app or a retail app or a C-store app, um, don't understand where you are, right? They don't know if you're sitting at home on your couch or you're in the drive through lane or, or you're in the store, right? Um, so um, I, I think location awareness is, is really important. Um, you know, there are some powerful ways to incorporate location into uh, these experiences that, that kind of go beyond what people typically think about when they think about geofencing. Um, you know, I think the sort of stereotypical geofencing use cases, uh, background location, you have an app installed, you know, it buzzes your phone with a, a coupon when you're nearby the store. Um, and, and, and that's great. That, that, that can make sense. Um, but I think there's potentially a lot more that you can be doing here. Um, if you sort of envision more geofences than that, maybe we're zooming in and thinking about, you know, the restaurant footprint and there's micro geofences in the, in the drive-through in the curbside pickup area. Um, maybe you're even using, you know, hardware like beacons to create these little sort of micro zones um, in store at, at, you know, at the registers and different tables, whatever. If you zoom out a little bit, um, you know, you can think about a geofence uh, when you're nearby the store. Maybe you have a geofence for a delivery zone, um, maybe one for a particular postal code or state or country. Um, so, uh, you know, I think with a geofencing configuration like this um, and, you know, a location platform that supports geofencing across, um, across different devices, different ordering channels, you know, that enables you to show the most relevant content, trigger workflows um, based, on, based on the user's location. So, um, you know, do you think about location? I think at the end of the day, all this ladders up to really seamless, right place, right time experiences. Um, across every part of the customer journey, again, regardless of ordering channel or device or, or physical location. Yeah, it, it's just incredible to see how far kind of location has come in terms of the marketing mix. I think we all started in marketing at one point. It was literally just giving the Excel file all the zip codes, and maybe we just try to, to segment people based on where they're located. But I think using this kind of real-time device location data and, and kind of this given data, I think is really important. Um, I also like kind of the, what you said about using geofencing to inform other channels, right? Whether it's push or SMS or email, I think at the end of the day, that, that geofence could be a trigger and then the messaging channel can go back into preferred channels and things like that. Um, Alan, I'm sure this is right up your alley as well. Um, what would you chime in on for the audience on this topic? Yeah, so I, I think for me, like one of the big things is I know as marketers, we get really excited when we have a lot of channels and a lot of ways to communicate with customers. Um, but I think one of the keys is like, don't bombard customers with the same message in every channel. So just because you can communicate with customers in every channel doesn't mean you necessarily should. And so we do a lot of um, use case mapping with our clients to determine like what is the best channel for the message or if, or if there is overlap, like what that right timing and cadence is. Um, one of the other things that I get asked a lot is because, you know, the majority of our customers do have a mobile app, since that's one of the core pieces of our business and capabilities is designing apps and websites. Um, we get a lot of questions around like push notifications and SMS. And so like, how do these strategies work together? Um, if they have push notifications, do they need SMS as well? Um, and we really advocate for a different strategy for both channels, you know, and really putting the customer at the center and helping prioritize when there are overlapping messages on some of the elements that I mentioned before. Um, some of the other ways that we look at, you know, activating SMS is I think that there's a lot that can be done with like SMS only offers where there is that exclusivity that you're giving customers something that they can't get in some of the other channels. And it really enhances the value prop of SMS as a whole. I think I think also the ability for two-way communication is huge. Um, you know, with push notifications, you're not able to get that feedback from customers and really, you know, close that loop. And so I think that is a, a big differentiator from an SMS value proposition perspective um, and a really good use case for a lot of our clients. And then the other one is really going back to what Nick was talking about and all of those different location specific activations that you can do through SMS that make it incredibly powerful. 
And because it is so real time, as customers are seeing it immediately on their phone, um, which is really, really effective. And so like for one example is, you know, we've done some research that says, you know, customers make a decision on what they're going to eat about 30 minutes before. So a lot of times this is not well planned in advance. And so being able to understand that customer behavior better and then being able to tailor that from a channel perspective. And so looking at channels like SMS is one that you can tailor it close to those timing of the eating occasions, um, you know, or something like email, people aren't checking their email box quite as frequently. And so really tailoring the strategy from a timing perspective in that way. And then uh, the last piece is really around measurement. And I think measurement is really key to success. And so we put lots of plans in place to like test, learn, and iterate. Um, you know, measurement is critical to any CRM program to make sure it's performing, you know, working with clients to define like what those right KPIs and objectives are. Um, so we actually have a whole measurement framework that we use that um, ladders up on three different levels um, and really ties in not only the transactional, but a lot of the emotional components that I mentioned before um, from a measurement perspective, uh, but also developing a solid test plan. Um, so for a lot of these channels um, and really the customer experience as a whole, you know, understanding not only what works in general for your audience, but also how it varies by different segments. Um, and then being able to adapt that, you know, based on the results that you're learning and continuously incorporating, you know, this into your ongoing strategy. I mean, I can't tell you how many clients that I work with and they they run all these tasks and they get these great learnings, but it's, it's a matter of making sure that you're diligent and incorporating those into the ongoing strategy, um, which is one of the areas that we're assisting with to make sure that it is, you know, driving better results over the long run. Yeah. I think so. First of all, I agree. I, I think I think testing and iterating based on the result, I think, are, are really key. Um, I'm also kind of chuckling because because to your point, like I order food a lot. I'll just be honest. And every time, you know, I get this delivery, I, I get a push notification text message together every single time, every single step of the whole journey. And, you know, it's great. I never miss the food because I know when it's delivered, but it's also can be a little too much at some point. Right. So I think it's really important to use. Some again, some of the profile information, channel transaction information, things like that to kind of decide which channel to use. Um, I think on our side, and, and you kind of alluded to this with um, the fact that people decide what they're going to eat 30 minutes before. I think context is really important when you actually think about which channel to use, right? So something more time sensitive, like lunchtime or happy hour, you need something with a little bit more immediacy, right? And we know SMS has a less than three minute read rate. So for something more immediate, SMS could be key, right? Um, and I think oftentimes we see that a lot of folks actually make the mistake of using something like SMS as a fallback channel versus actually taking advantage of the fact that it's got more immediacy and broader reach than other ones, right? I think the other thing we see is also the, the target audience um, and, and kind of what you're trying to convey to them. Um, again, SMS is a broader adoption. So if you want something quick and instant and something they can reply to, that might be the best channel, right? But if you have something that actually is a little bit bigger in terms of content where you need to have more room for copy, email might be key because, again, it might not be time sensitive, but it gives you a lot more for imagery, links, text and things like that. And then something that maybe offers a lot of personalization or maybe it's for your power app users, a push notification could be key there as well. Right. So I think you got to understand, like, who's the audience? What's the message type? How quickly do you actually want them to respond and take an action? And then obviously look at the opt-in status as well, right? If people aren't opted into your app, then that shouldn't be the only channel you communicate with them on. Um, and I think that we talk about, I think a lot of customers and marketers are using all their channels and connecting it, right? So I think the best experiences we're seeing is companies who kind of use this hub and spoke model. So they'll have a CDP or an internal data warehouse kind of sitting in the middle that combines all this data, enriches it, cleanses it, and then provides logic like, you know, what's their last active channel, what's their opt-in status with different channels. And then they'll, they'll partner with best in breed vendors like us to actually basically execute that message and optimize it over time, right? I think the last thing we're also seeing that's really helpful is cross-promoting channels, right? We all know that, you know, consumers that are active on more than one channel ultimately have a higher lifetime value and better retention. So we've seen a lot of folks use SMS to promote an app download, use email to promote their app or SMS, use social to, uh, to promote some sort of first party opt-in. I don't think that these channels are ultimately competing, but they should also be working together to promote each other. Because again, if I opt out of the app and you have email and you have SMS and vice versa and things like that. So 
I think we can, again, this is another topic we can talk about forever, but before we wrap it up, there is one more pro tip I wanna to get to. This pro tip is all about making phone numbers the center of your strategy. And we talked about the value of the phone number, but I think ultimately the big thing we're trying to call out here is there's a lot of different touch points you have with the consumer, whether they're in store or buying, whether they're online, whether they're on your social program, whether it's partners, there's numerous ways to actually drive online and offline customer facing engagement to actually get that first party opt-in. So whether you're putting a QR code on the receipt or the actual packaging, whether you're asking for an opt-in in the app or your, your social channel, we've seen best marketers using multiple different channels to get that first party opt-in and then using subsequent messaging to actually expand the data, expand the profile and promote the channels as well. All right, uh, we're moving on to our final topic. Uh, and I think it's a big topic that brings everything all together. Um, and Alan, I want to start with you here. Um, when we think about the digital maturity model, including SMS, um, when should brands start to leverage some of the strategy we talked about today? What, what's typically your advice on this? Yeah, so at Bounteous Hathway, we actually have an entire growth marketing maturity model. And so channels is actually one of the nine facets in the maturity model. Uh, but essentially, the way that we use this is actually to calibrate, you know, Tech, technology investments that brands are making and how that translates into comp growth for their business. And so we did an analysis looking back to 2019 um, and we looked at brands all across the restaurant space that have loyalty programs and don't have loyalty programs and just looked at, you know, what types of investments were they making in digital technology and marketing and how that's translating from a comp growth perspective. And so all of this feeds into um, our growth marketing maturity model. And so as we're having these conversations with clients, we find that different clients are looking to basically move at different velocities. So we have some that are more, you know, crawl walk, and then we have some that are more, you know, just getting starting out, but they want to move at extremely high velocity and move up this maturity model very quickly. And so, you know, it has five different levels that brands sit at and you can be different levels in different facets of the maturity model and it spans everything from acquisition strategy and how you're acquiring customers across all of your channels um, it has a whole category around crm strategy and execution and that contains things like segmentation content personalization and channels and so that channel piece is where sms falls in um, and really looking at, you know, what channels are you leveraging today, how coordinated they are from a strategy standpoint, and also how coordinated they are from a technology standpoint, um, which really feeds into another area of the maturity model, which is all around technology and automation. And so, you know, helping our clients identify the right partners to power their strategy. So, you know, we consider attentive a leader for SMS and integrate, and it also integrates well into many of their existing technology platforms, which is super helpful um, and really effective. And then the last piece of it is really around like the measurement reporting and ways of working and how advanced the client is on measuring performance, having visibility into the results, and then how much they're actually using data uh, to power their strategy, as well as a test and learn culture to be able to push the program forward. And so a lot of the ways that we use this tool are actually doing like a quick audit of where you are today, uh, but also have discussions around where you want to go and how fast you want to get there. And so we partner with clients to build a roadmap for you know how to get you there, um, where and when to incorporate SMS into that strategy if they don't already have it. And if they do, then helping to maximize the value of it uh, based on all of the existing technology that they already have. That, that's uh, I think I think a lot of valuable information. I think I've seen I've seen you and Vanessa Hathaway go through this a few times. I think you could probably do a whole masterclass on this, honestly. And, and we should maybe start taking some subscriptions and and running our side business. The masterclass on digital maturity. I'm sure someone's going to make it now. Um, I think on our side, there's a lot of things that, that I think we have in common in terms of kind of your approach to it. Um, I think with SMS specifically. A lot of times we get this question of like, hey, should I do this now? Should I wait? When is the right time? I have all these different projects happening. And I think typically what we see is if you have online ordering in place, um, you're kind of ready to go, at least to start with. I think oftentimes the mistake we see is someone is hyper focused on building their app, building a new website, building a loyalty program. And these are really critical initiatives that are, that are really important for, for restaurants. 
But some of these can take three to six months to develop, right? And oftentimes, a lot of folks, while they're working on that, they put everything else on hold. And we've seen that some of the best strategies and results are, you know, taking advantage of the short-term kind of gains with SMS. So getting some sort of opt-in going, driving some immediate revenue from the channel with online ordering. And then once the app is ready, loyalty program is ready, we open a new store, whatever it might be, actually using this channel, this engaged audience, going back to that emotional connection to promote kind of the new channels, right? I think a lot of the clients we've seen that have the best results in terms of other initiatives have actually started first by having some sort of easy first party opt-in like SMS, getting people into the funnel, and then using some of the subsequent messaging and strategies you talked about to promote the longer tail projects, right? And I think ultimately all this is going to be incremental, right? Like the first day you do SMS, it's going to look a lot different than the six months and 12 months down the road. So I think it's just a matter of these, these small micro improvements over time. But there's a huge opportunity cost I think a lot of folks forget about when they're working on one project and think that they, that they can't multitask on other projects as well. Um, I know location is a big part of this, Nick. We talked about this, right, especially when it comes to the last mile experience. Um, when you think about, you know, geofencing, kind of different ways you can uh, leverage platforms like Radar, where does this kind of fit into the maturity model? How do you typically guide customers through it? You know, when to think about it, what sort of progression to take on the channel and things like that? Sure. Um, you know, we, we do think about a location maturity model at Radar. You know, one thing that's interesting is it's, it's kind of different depending on industry, right? So if you're, you know, a seed stage startup building the next Uber or the next DoorDash, you might be investing in really sophisticated, you know, geofencing and location tracking from, from day one. Um, if you're, you know, an upstart, fast growing QSR brands, um, you're probably going to start somewhere different. So I think typically what we see is, you know, one of the first things that you build into an app is a, a store locator. Um, you know, there you need things like address autocomplete, location search, geocoding. Um, you know, later we see folks progress to more advanced use cases. So, um, you know, location-based arrival detection for, for order ahead, um, maybe some uh, location-based uh, messaging like we've, like we've talked about. Maybe that's with uh, background location permissions once you've sort of built up user trust. Um, an on-premise mode. So um, are you elevating things like, um, you know, contactless payments or a loyalty program when you're in store um, and elevating things like, you know, order ahead functionality when you're, when you're not. Um, you know, beyond that, um, you, you, know, you can potentially go even more sophisticated with location. Maybe you're doing, you know, order firing or order sequencing based on location. So actually, you know, automatically kicking off the preparation of an order or sequencing orders based on you know, how far away somebody is from, from the restaurant. Um, maybe you're even bringing, you know, uh, some delivery capabilities in house uh, to sort of avoid paying that, you know, DoorDash tax uh, or, or whatever you want to call it. And, and, and maybe there are some location tracking capabilities uh, there. So that's how we think about the location maturity curve. I, I think part of what we're trying to do at Radar, and this is true for restaurants, but it's also true across industries is to kind of shift the curve a little bit and say, hey, there are these really incredible um, location capabilities that you, know, you might think of as a, a nice to have in the early days, or you might think of as, as later in the maturity curve, but actually kind of say, no, this is dead simple now, pull that forward. You know, how, how can we help you think about this from, from day one? And you know, sort of change perceptions about like what's possible, uh, what's, what's table stakes at, at your stage. Um, you know, part of that is, um, uh, really flexible infrastructure and developer tools for some of the biggest brands that have in-house engineering or, or digital teams. Um, but, you know, we also want to unlock these types of experiences for smaller uh, upstart growing restaurant brands as well. Um, a big part of that is partnerships. So we do a lot of work with Hathaway, Bounteous, um, their nom -nom platform. Uh, we do partnership with, with Olo, uh, which is a um, really great order management platform that I'm sure folks are, are familiar with. Um, so we, we have a location maturity curve that, that I think has been the historical one, but, but a big challenge for us, a big opportunity for us is, is how do we shift that? Um, and, uh, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, SMS, geofencing, all, all, all these great capabilities, it's really all about delivering seamless, convenient experiences. You know, consumers are going to stick with brands that deliver those seamless, convenient experiences. Um, I think more and more of the stuff is going to become table stakes, um, and, and so, um, 
how can you be one of the early adopters? How can you set yourself apart? How can you use great platforms like Radar, like Attentive, um, to uh, avoid reinventing the wheel and uh, you know focus on the parts of your digital experience um, that are truly unique to to you? So that, that's kind of how we think about the location uh, maturity model at at Radar. Nick, what what, do, what would you say is typically, and, and I'm going to put you on the spot, like what's typically like the most common first use case or kind of problem? Uh, customers are using radar to kind of solve. Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned that one of the first um, uh, one of the first use cases in, in the maturity curve is often a store locator, right? Yeah. And, and historically, that wasn't something that we did. And we actually had a lot of our restaurant customers ask us, "Hey, you're already storing all of our restaurants as geofences. You're already powering these other great location capabilities in our app." Um, can't you help us power store locator as well? So we launch yeah. search and, and, and geocoding APIs. Um, you know, it might be the first thing you build, but it also gets tricky and complex as you scale. Google Maps APIs are expensive. We have a lot of restaurant customers that are paying Google Maps an arm and a leg. And, and we're looking to radar to just sort of say, hey, I want to standardize on one location platform, geofencing, trip tracking, geocoding, yeah. bring it all in-house. So yeah. No, that, that's interesting. I, I think it also, I mean, I think we all agree there's some sort of incremental improvement and in sophistication over time. Um, but it also seems like a lot of it also goes back to the question of like, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What what part of the life cycle are you trying to focus on? Because if it's, you know, making sure that first time buyer is happy, it's the last mile experience. If it's getting your loyalty user back into it, maybe it's some sort of notification as they're walking by the store, right? Or some sort of reminder to redeem their coupon and some sort of loyalty point, things like that. So I think the moral of the story is it's going to be incremental, but you got to kind of think about what are you trying to solve today versus six months versus 12 months in your journey. All right. Um, we're getting to our final pro tip. Um, and this one, again, is about we talked a little bit about when to kind of get into different types of initiatives. Um, I think with, with SMS, we think you should start early. I think ultimately, if you're spending any money on driving traffic to your website, to your locations, in this, in this example, to your Instagram site, you're you're presenting with that opportunity to actually convert them to first party options, right? It's a huge opportunity cost. If you're driving people to the funnel, driving to the, to the website, and you're not finding some sort of way to optimize that top of the funnel and get these first party options. All right. We've, we've come to the, the, the last topic for today. Um, and I think it was an incredible conversation. I'm sure we can talk about these four for, for hours, uh, but we've got some time for Q and A. So if you haven't already put your questions in the Q and A box, Please submit them right now, and we'll do our best to, to actually go through in the next uh, few minutes. All right, uh, Nick, the first question I have is for you. Um, what is one of the most clever or unique examples you've seen a business in the restaurant or relative space use radar for? Sure. Um, there are lots. Uh, you know, I, I think the one that comes to mind is, is everything that Panera is doing to launch their next generation bakery cafe. So. Um, we're helping Panera power everything from uh, location-based arrival detection to uh, uh, for curbside pickup uh, to potentially other types of unique in-store uh, and, and drive-through experiences as well um, over time. So I think that's one example. Uh, there are a number of customers, and, and we're going to be publishing some case studies soon that use radar for all sorts of really sophisticated um, order firing and, and, and order sequencing. Um, for example, you place an order for curbside pickup. Um, and you're five minutes away and, you know, the fries are dropped in the, the fryer, right? And they come out hot and crispy when, when you arrive, um, really seamless, uh, using some of our pre-built integrations for, uh, for these capabilities. Um, and, uh, we, you know, I think, uh, pretty soon, you know, gone are the days of pulling into a parking lot, you know, kind of questioning where, 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 where do I go? Do I go in store? Um, you know, you're, you're sitting there waiting for 10 minutes and, and you know, food quality is, is, is disappointing when the, when the food shows up and, and wait times are high. Um, for Radar Attentive specifically, um, Radar and Attentive together specifically rather, uh, it's a new integration. You know, I think there's some really exciting stuff in the works. So uh, my hunch is there'll be some case studies coming soon. Uh, stay tuned. Um, you know, Amir, I think you mentioned earlier that SMS can be really powerful when something is um, immediate and you need to you know, really get somebody's attention. And, and obviously, uh, you know, real-time location is, is, is a great input to that. So um, yeah. more yeah. to share there soon. Yeah, I think one of the, the, the my least favorite things is cold, soggy fries. So I think the time thing is, 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 is perfect for that. 
Um, all right, our next question. Um, we'd love to hear some best in class examples of SMS campaign messaging that promotes app downloads. Well, we could probably talk about a lot of these. Uh, what I would say is make sure you guys go to Text We Love. It's a, it's a website we have that includes a lot of customer examples. I think st some of the ones that I think about are kind of two different strategies. We have one customer where everything they want to do needs to drive app downloads and loyalty enrollment. So they're using our SMS uh, channel to get that first party opt-in and then using communication. But everything that the user needs to redeem actually has to go through the app. So they're using SMS to get that first party opt-in using the immediacy of the channel, but they're still driving all their transactions and engagement through their app because it's a big investment and they know people are stickier when they use the app. So I think that's one example I really like. The other example I like is we have customers who are actually just using an SMS audience and then promoting the app as there's some new initiatives. So sometimes there's app only promotions or, or secret menu items. A lot of folks, when they refresh their loyalty program, they also relaunch an app. So we've seen some brands actually use those campaigns to actually re-promote the net new app or updates and things like that. Um, so again, it, it's a little bit based on your strategy. I think the best one we've seen is having a really wide top of the funnel and then using segmentation, behaviors, last active channel to kind of basically decide on which, which thing you promote next. Um, Ellen, next question is for you. Um, you mentioned how you use uh, purchase data and, and kind of what you guys work on. Are you talking about like purchase data from the brand or like third party data outside the four walls of the brand? Yeah. So when I was referencing earlier, we're talking about for purchase data from the brand itself. And so because we're, you know, using the loyalty program, we have a lot of that data. Um, it's easiest to activate. Now, that being said, you know, we do work with clients to expand data and do like third party data pens and things like that when it makes sense. Um, but we usually like to start with that first party data because uh, we find that's the most effective. Um, we've also done some things to go a lot broader from like a consumer research perspective and just understand like where customers are buying, you know, what are their lifestyle activities. And sometimes a lot of that is feeding into like marketing and segmentation strategies outside of a lot of the data that we're capturing on a purchase level from the brand. And so there's lots of different ways that we're capturing and activating that data. Um, but, it, you know, when I was referencing it earlier, it was definitely from the loyalty aspect. Yeah, nice, nice. And, and Ellen, while I have you um, kind of connected to this, so what are some of the tools that you use for actually measuring, you know, campaign results and specific segment responses, right? Is it something Pathway has proprietarily, or is it kind of just, you know, Google Analytics? All analytics. How do you guys actually look and measure all this stuff? Yeah, so we actually have um, an analytics and intelligence department that's actually doing a lot of the campaign analysis. Um, they can actually build, you know, custom segmentations and models for a lot of our clients, uh, but are also doing that campaign level analysis across all the various channels to understand like what the overall impact is from a marketing perspective and also informing and giving the strategy team insights into you know, where should we should be going next uh, to maximize the value. Nice. And I think this is also, I think, to your point, integrations really come into play. So I know um, one of our most popular integrations at Attentive is with Olo. And the first kind of phase of that integration was attribution specifically for this, right? So being able to actually uh, not just use unique coupon codes and things like that to give you more reporting, but also being able to actually send a message, promote something in an Olo ecosystem, and then actually see the reporting and attribution on the actual dashboard itself. So um, again, there's a lot of different ways to, I think, look, look at reporting, right? There is RFM models, or you can get into data science and things like that. But I think some of the things you guys do with Bounty Pathways is, is pretty incredible. All right. Um, one thing I wanted to, to dig into is we talked about integrations. Um, Nick, I, I know you guys are really kind of expanding your integration ecosystem as well. Obviously, we're, we're building something together, but I think Olo has come up a lot for us, especially in the restaurant uh, vertical. I want to talk a little bit about what you guys are doing there with the old integration. Yeah, definitely. Um, excited to answer this question, Mary, because I, I know you mentioned Olo a couple of times and uh, they're also a great partner of ours. Um, you know, we see them as the, the leader in, in their space um, and we've been working with them for, for a while. Um, but what we announced recently was a new integration for order firing specifically. Um, so basically the way it works is order is placed, that order is created in Olo. A trip is automatically started um, in Radar, which... Um, We'll track the customer's location and their their live ETA as they come to pick up the order, um, and then ultimately that can actually 
uh, fire the order, uh, you know, trigger, trigger preparation um, when the user is, or, or when the customer is uh, approaching the, the restaurant. So super exciting stuff, kind of going back to this theme of seamless, convenient experiences, decreasing uh, wait times, you know, uh, improving food quality and, and ultimately, you know, uh, stronger customer, customer lifetime value. I think in general, um, you know, integrations are key. I, I think we're seeing, um, you know, some, some of the smartest restaurant brands kind of composing a stack of, uh, of best in class tools that are all really, really tightly integrated. Um, you know, the attentives, the Olos, the radars, um, we have partners, um, uh, in, uh, other categories as well, CDPs like MParticle um, and Segment, um, analytics platforms. Um, and, and I think you can bring all these together and, and deliver these types of really seamless experiences. I, I know Ellen and the folks at Hathaway think about sort of having a you know, best-in-class toolkit as well. So um, yeah. thinking about a extensible, well-integrated uh, set of tools that kind of equip you for the future and whatever use cases you might decide to sort of build against or pursue not just, you know, this quarter, but also, you know, next year and, and, and five years in the future is, is really important. Yeah, I think this also kind of touches on another question we have that's kind of relevant is, is ultimately, you know, do people use attentive and SMS for post meal collection of, of feedback, surveys, online reviews? And I think this goes back to part of its integrations, right? Being able to integrate with Olo and other systems to send transactional messages. So we do have a transactional API that helps us fire off a lot of these purchase messages, but we also have a lot of like automated journeys. So we have coupon reminders, coupon nudge reminders, and then we also do post post campaign messaging. We do integrate with some of our uh, partners who do uh, surveys and feedback. Um, a lot of times we do post purchase promotion of an app or something else. So I think a lot of it comes down to creating that that journey that says, all right, once they once they actually pick up their order, what do you, what do you want to happen next? Do you want them to give you feedback? Do you want to tell them about your loyalty program? What's the next call to action? But to answer the question directly, we are definitely uh, working with a lot of brands that are actually doing post post purchase uh, messaging as well. Um, this next question I think is probably relevant for all of us. Um, we got about six minutes. I think we should have enough time to get through it. Um, how does how much time per week does like an independent independent restaurant need to really dedicate to some of the channels we talked about? I know the, the question was kind of aimed around SMS marketing. I think in terms of you know how much time you need. It depends on how sophisticated you're getting, but I think smart solutions like Attentive should be able to help you automate a lot of it. So the, the list collection, the welcome flow, the compliance, the first purchase order. And then, you know, you typically we have CSMs that actually do a lot of handholding and help create different marketing calendars. So we have customers as small as like three people, single operators that are running the program themselves to really large organizations who are doing it themselves. And then I'm sure Ellen, there's a lot of vendors that actually work with you guys and you guys help manage those programs. So from your point of view and Nick's point of view, how much time do you think these individual restaurants need to dedicate to managing these channels? Yeah, I mean, we see all sorts of different organizations and layouts. And um, as far as like how teams are structured, um, we do find that a lot of times it's a pretty small team on the client side that is actually running a lot of these programs. And so that's one of the reasons why a lot of times they bring in like a bounteous pathway into the picture is because they need to scale. <laughs> and so it kind of goes back to that growth marketing maturity model too, and the velocity that you want to move. And so the, 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 brands that are okay, you know, kind of moving into that crawl phase. Um, I think that there's a lot of automations that can actually help, you know, make it super efficient. Uh, but ones that are really looking to move at that fast a lot of velocity, kind of helping from, you know, a strategic perspective, but also an implementation perspective, and then a measurement and iteration perspective too. Um, that's where we see it being most effective. And, and, and Nick, on your side, uh, we'd love to hear maybe kind of a, the second part of this question as well. Like, how much time does it take to manage? And ultimately, kind of go back to the maturity, like what needs to be in place to be able to actually use something like a radar? Obviously, you want to have app and location, things, things like that. But talk to us about both how much human power it takes, but also what sort of like table stakes you need to even be able to use something like a radar. Sure. Um, I don't know if I have too much to add beyond what Ellen said in terms of, you know, time per week spent, I, I think I would just underscore the fact that um, there are a lot of great partners and, and, and patterns out there to, to follow r rather than reinventing the wheel. So, you know, I think working with uh, you know, Bounteous Hathaway who have, you know, done this with, with, with proven success for other brands, um, 
when, uh, you know, when the timing is right, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, requirements to, to use radar and kind of going back to the, the maturity curve point, um, uh, so radar does need to be installed in a mobile app to work. Uh, now that could be your own uh, owned mobile app. That could be one that, um, you know, somebody like a Hathaway Bounteous develops for you. Um, and uh, increasingly we're uh, being built into white label apps um, as well. Um, you know, in, in terms of location permissions, you, you can do a lot with uh, just foreground when in use location permissions. So the store locator use cases that I mentioned, the on-premise use cases uh, that I mentioned, and even a lot of the, um, you know, you might think that some of the, um, you know, location tracking and live ETAs for curbside pickup, for example, requires background tracking. Um, it actually doesn't, uh, depending on how you do it. And I, I think most of, most of us are used to, you know, punching in a destination on Google Maps or Apple Maps, starting navigation, seeing that flashing blue bar up top. Um, Uber is doing this now too, if you share your location with, with the driver, um, you can background the app and you'll, you'll still see that flashing blue bar and, and you can do that only with foreground permissions. Um, I, I think it's a common misconception. So, um, if you've built trust with users and, um, uh, you know, you get background permissions, you can do all sorts of sophisticated and thoughtful, you know, targeting, uh, and, and triggering as well, but but only foreground permissions required for for a lot of this. And I'll I'll stop there because I know we're coming up on on time. No, I think that's that's critical. Again, it goes back to those given permissions, right? So, all right, I know we can go on forever, but but we are going to get cut off in two minutes. But this wraps up the discussion for today. Just a huge thanks to both Nick and Alan for joining us and sharing your expertise and insights. Um, the fun of learning doesn't stop though, so hang tight for interactive roundtables. Uh, these are hosted by Attentive. Bounteous Hathaway and Radar, where you can actually dig deeper into these topics with individuals from each company. Um, to get to the roundtables, just wait a few seconds. In about two minutes, you'll actually get pushed into that. Or just click the Interactive Roundtables tab on the navigation bar and then choose your preferred roundtable. Um, when joining, please turn on your camera or microphone. Like, make this as, as human as possible, interactive, participate and ask questions. And keep in mind that it's limited to only 30 people per roundtable. It's first come, first serve. So as soon as you get there, sign up. If it's full, get on the wait list or join another table. And lastly, before you guys leave, there is a, there's, a, there's a survey in the chat. Please be sure to take it. That's how we improve. That's how we get your feedback on the content, the speakers, the format. Um, but without anything else, I just want to, again, thank everybody for tuning in. Thank our speakers. And we'll see you in the roundtables in just a few seconds. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.